you've got your Bible, please stand with me to Ephesians 3. Forgive me if you are a visitor and you are here for the first time. For me, just talking to um, the members of this community or this church, but um, I felt we needed to do that. Ephesians 3, from verse 1 till verse 6. So what we are doing is we are continuing with our series on Ephesians. And we are going to be reading here Ephesians with you, and you'll follow me, and then I will explain everything from this text. And can I just say this? What I'm going to bring to you today, it wasn't easy for me to prepare. Because in it, there's something about suffering, which I want to deal with, I want to talk about with you this morning. Is that okay? Yes. All right. So Ephesians 3, from verse 1 till verse 6. This is how it reads. This is Paul. We've heard what's happened before, right? Paul is talking about how he is reaching the nations of the world from different backgrounds because Christ wants a church that's one new man from different tribes and tongues. Now Paul seems to be changing gear here in Ephesians. He says, for this reason, what reason? The reason that the church will be established and a great church in, in the nation. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to see his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What we're going to be looking at this today is that we're going to be looking at we as a people of God are heirs. It's interesting that what Paul says here, he says we are heirs, members of Christ's body. Okay? And let me just say this. You realize how Paul starts this passage. He starts by saying, I, Paul. So what I'm going to be looking at today is Paul, the man, I, Paul. Secondly, I'm going to be looking at his present state, a prisoner for the Lord. And I'm going to be looking at his future hope, which is, uh, and for us, we are, Paul is calling us, as of the promise in Christ through the gospel. So those three, Paul, suffering, earth. Paul. It's interesting how he starts. He's saying, I, Paul, and then he says, comma, and he says, a prisoner for the Lord. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yes. I, Paul, a prisoner for the Lord. How come? Is he? Is he a prisoner for the Lord Jesus? Is that because Jesus has done it? But the key thing here I want us to focus on is I, Paul, comma. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because Paul, in most of his messages, his, or his letters that he writes, he seems to be doing this a lot. He seems to be saying, I, Paul, comma, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Have you ever thought about it? That Paul has never used Apostle Paul, comma, by the will of God. But he's saying, I, Paul, Paul's. Paul understands that he is first a son before he's a prisoner for the Lord. He understands that he's first Paul before he's an apostle. Let me tell you a joke. <laughs> Go for it, pussy. There's this great big grizzly bear. 
and this bear walks into a bar and he sees this bartender and he looks at the bartender and says, can I have a pint of beer and a packet of peanuts? And the bartender turns around and he looks at Grizzly Bear and says, what's with the paws, the big paws? <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah. No, you didn't get it. <laughs> Can I have a beer? And a packet of peanuts. The bartender turns around and says, what's with the big paws? What's with the big paws? <laughs> Not the pause between, the pause! <laughs> oh. yeah. I like it. That's why I didn't become a comedian. <laughs> because you know why? People will laugh of the fact that it wasn't Actually, a joke. No. <laughs> Not because I told a joke. That's why I told you that it was going to be a joke. <laughs> I just want to check, Joel, as you are laughing, that you are able to leave a big pause between Joel, the preacher of the Lord Jesus. Not preacher, Joel. Businessman, Kevin. No. Kevin, pause. A businessman. Mother Lucy, we got a Lucy. Sorry, Lucy. <laughs> Mother Lucy, no. Lucy, pause. Yeah. Mother. If your identity is based on what you do, then you are in trouble. That's right. A lot of you, some of you, call me Pastor Fuzi. And I often tell you, just call me Fusi, right? But I'm not going to fight that battle anymore. I just want you to know that. However, when I receive it, I receive it this way. Fusi, comma, a pastor. Why? Because when Jesus called me, he didn't call me a pastor. He called me by my name. He called me first. And then what I'm doing is secondary. That my identity is not based on me being a pastor, but it's based on the fact that God called me and saved me by His grace, and of course later for good works. But if the good works just seem to be your identity, let me warn you, when things don't go well, with what has now become your identity that wasn't your identity or shouldn't be your identity, you will either freak out or you will have your earliest midlife crisis or you would leave the church. Why? Because if pastor is your or is my identity, when that bit of my identity is going through difficulty, my whole identity is falling apart. Right. Yeah, right. Excellent. But if I am Fusi, because God, when I was born, I was Fusi, yes. When God called me, he didn't call Fusi the pastor, he called Fusi. And by the way, because of his grace, he decided that I'll be a pastor. Mm. That that itself is more important than who you are, Paul, that between who Paul is and what he does as an apostle for Jesus Christ, or even when you are faced with trouble and suffering, that you don't so fully identify with trouble and suffering that it becomes you or who you are, that there's a big pause between who you are and what you are going through. That's right. Because that is so important. Because when the motherhood aspect of your life as a mother, the mother bit is not going well, your identity is going to suffer. Mm -hmm. When your business is not going well, because you are a businessman, what did I say, Kevin? Mm -hmm. Not your Kevin. <laughs> the Kevin bit seems to be suffering because the business bit has been struggling. And let me just say this to you. When God, when Jesus Christ called you, he called you by name first, 
He saved you because He loves you. He didn't save you because you are a pastor, a businessman, an accountant, an architect, an engineer, and this and that and that. That is secondary to who you are. Your identity is based on who you are as in God, what God has called you rather than what you do. Amen. Please, let's not model this. You are who you are. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 15, 10, what does it say? I am what I am by, by the grace of God. Not I am what I am because I'm a businessman. Mm -hmm. Not because I'm a worship leader. Because when that bit is not going right, your identity will fall apart. So Paul, in this, he recognizes that first of all, he's called as Paul before he's called as a, a prisoner to suffer for the Lord. Did we get that? Yes. So who we are comes before what we do. Yeah. Our identity, otherwise, if those two come together, we'll be in trouble. And you will, sh you will tell because of how you react when things are not going well. Okay? I, Paul, pause. So I just want to make sure you are able to leave a, a big enough pause there between Paul and a prisoner for Jesus Christ. The second thing is what Paul is going through right now. What Paul seems to be going through. He is in prison. Most historians and theologians believe that Paul was in prison for Jesus Christ, was in prison for the Lord. But they, they suggest that Paul saw his imprisonment as something that came because God wanted him to fulfill something greater, but also because Paul wanted to suffer for nothing else but the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what I find is that most times when this word er is mentioned, is mentioned almost in the same passage, almost always in the Bible, in the same passage as suffering. Have you ever looked into that? A son adopted, you are heir in the kingdom of God for Jesus Christ. We are heirs, but by the way, think about your suffering. A lot of times we don't talk about suffering in the Christian church because we either try to deny it or we try to not talk about it much and yet we face that on a daily basis. Let me just say this, you live long enough, you will suffer. Whether small or big things, something does happen. Whether it's a small little pain here that's happened, or it's something big, we seem to be going through that. But God, through the scriptures, seems to be doing something else when we suffer. And it doesn't suggest here, and anywhere in the scriptures, that God is the one who's making us suffer. But when we suffer, what is God's response? What's God doing when we suffer? Look at this again, where Paul is talking about us believers as heirs, but he's also talking about us suffering as well. Here's another passage that's very classic. Look, this is what he says. This is Romans 8, verse 17 to 24. He says, now, if we are children of God, then we are heirs. Heirs of God. That sounds like good news, right? And caught heirs with Christ. Sounds good news. But listen to what he says. If indeed we suffer, <laughs> if indeed we share in his suffering, it's almost like it's conditional here, but it's not. He says, you are God's heirs. And he says, provided you suffer with Christ. In order that we may also share in his glory. There's something else about the future, by the way. I consider that our present sufferings, the suffering that we have now, bad news, are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. Amen. Good news. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Why do we suffer? Because creation is a bit confused. Not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. 
in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into what's the future? The freedom of the children of God. Paul is very realistic here about our current or our present state. And he's also, in the same breath, talking about our future hope as well. Many people go through a lot in their lives. I have known many people who've gone through a lot of suffering and who are still holding on to Christ. But I've also known quite a few people. In fact, I was dealing with someone recently, as recent as this yesterday, who has been contemplating suicide because the person has suffered a lot. And I'm here, and I'm talking to the person who's in another country in Europe, and I'm saying, listen, God has greater things for you. And he's saying, I don't know why I'm living. Because he suffered, and he says, I don't want to believe in God anymore. So I'm having to help him. And last night, he said, uh, he said I've been a fool to believe the lie. I'm coming back to Jesus, running because God is enough for us when we suffer. The thing is, the gospel does not deny suffering, but it deals with the situation when we are in suffering. And if our gospel that we preach, our theology, our understanding of God, just denies suffering, does not cater for suffering, then we are in trouble. If because we are called by God, our theology says we'll never suffer, then explain to me the book of Job. Explain to me Paul, who seems to be doing something so amazing for God, maybe one of the greatest Christians who's ever lived, and yet as he's writing right now, he's writing from prison. And he's talking about his suffering. And he talks about his suffering later as well. But let me just help you here, if I can, to say this, as children of God, we suffer differently to how the world suffers. Our response to suffering should be very different to how the world responds to suffering. And let me just mention three things that I feel are very important when we are faced with suffering. And we look at, through this by looking at the scriptures as well. The first thing that we do when we suffer is that we resist. What are we resisting? We resist in the, the lie that God does not care. Because when you suffer, one of the things that you are confronted with is this myth, God does not care about me. Because that's the first thing that seems to come to people's mind. If he cares about me, why is it that he's letting me suffer? Because our idea of God we worship is that he is that God, that Father, who when we go through suffering, the first thing that he needs to do is shield the suffering away from us. But actually, we will see later that God is not divorced from our suffering when we go through suffering. But the first thing that we need to respond through when we go through suffering is about resisting the lie that God does not care. Do you remember Luke 4 and Matthew 4? Jesus finds himself in the wilderness. He's been tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And the enemy says, curse. He says, eat this or I'll give you this money. I'll, I'll offer you this. What does he do? He resists the lies of the enemy. He says, a man shall not eat by bread alone. He says, a man shall not survive by bread alone. But by the word of God that comes from the mouth of God, he's resisting what the enemy is bringing. And I just want to check, how are we doing with resisting the lie that God, who, was, who sent his son to die on the cross for our sin, does not care? The second thing that we are to respond with through suffering is requesting. When I'm saying resisting, I'm not saying live in denial, but resist the lie that God is not involved in this time. I'm on my own, I'm caught up with suffering, and God doesn't care. Sometimes we think God just lives up there somewhere, 
and he doesn't care. He wasn't there when I needed him. Let me tell you one. Even he was closer to you in the time of suffering than the, your relatives, your mother, your father, your spouse, and everyone around. He is there with you, as he was with Jesus on the cross. But we also don't just say, all right, then I'm just going to resist. We ought to request. What I'm talking about here is I'm talking about us being active in really requesting through prayer and many other ways that God, you are powerful and you will come and intervene. Sometimes we do, some people will do a lot of resisting but no requesting. Do you remember Paul himself? He was struggling in 2 Corinthians 12 and he was struggling a lot because he's talking about this thorn in the flesh. He calls it a messenger from Satan. That's, that has come to torment him. What does he say? He says, I've, I've asked the Lord to take it away from me. Which means he is requesting God. Let us be those who are praying for breakthroughs. Let us be those who pray for people and pray that God will come through. Let us not just accept the situation as it is, but let's first resist the lie that God doesn't care, but also request that God, please, you alone can come and intervene and bring breakthrough in this situation. Amen. Because we know that the God we serve is the God of breakthrough and he will bring breakthrough. Amen. What if he doesn't? Do you remember Daniel? Daniel and uh, his friends when his friends were about to be thrown in the dungeon and they said, we are not going to worship Nebuchadnezzar. And this was a fury furnace. The, the fire was getting hotter and hotter. And he says, because our God will come and rescue us faith. But then they say, even if he doesn't, we will worship him anyway. Right. I'm not so sure we often have, even if it doesn't, in our lives. The imbalanced theology about suffering does not help us when things don't go the way we expect. But the one thing that we do is we rest in the sovereignty of God. That God, who was able to use the cross as a symbol that it was, the cross was a symbol of punishment and suffering. God was able to use it as a symbol of love and glory. That God who is able to reconcile the irreconcilable will be able to uh, know why and how and why he's not intervening in the way that I thought he would intervene. But the one thing I know is that God is there. Because Romans 8 says, in all things, it doesn't say some things, and by the way, that passage is loaded. Some, all things, including everything that you are now thinking about. God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called by his purposes. In 28, and uh, the theologian Michael Eaton says, God works the bad for the good, and the good for the good. That's the sovereignty of God. A man called... Samuel Rutherford once said, I delight to be in the cellar, like wine cellar. For those who are into wine here, I delight to be in the cellar of suffering. And it says, because the great king keeps his wine in there. That doesn't sound like an easy statement. Spurgeon says, this is what he says, he says, they who dive in the sea of affliction bring up a rare pearl. We need maturity when it comes to the issue of suffering. Because when it hits us, we sometimes think God doesn't care. In Romans 5, Paul makes it very clear. He says, he says our momentary afflictions, which means the sufferings that we have right now, produce for us what? A future glory. And also, he talks about how suffering seems to be very productive. What does it produce? 
Suffering produces perseverance. Parade perseverance, character. Character, hope, and hope does not fail. So that means whatever we are going through, if we are suffering, like Paul is saying, for God and for Jesus Christ, we can turn that for God's glory by saying, even if I'm suffering now, I will not lose heart, nor grow weary, I will embrace this for Jesus Christ. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. It's amazing what Gary has done and how amazing she's been. Gary was diagnosed with cancer quite a while back and she stood at this platform a few times and said, I love Jesus. And if I don't get healed, I still love Jesus. Do you know what? She, she, she wasn't healed right away, but God did intervene and heal her. Because now, Skelly is, where is Skelly? Can you just raise up your hand wherever you are? She is amazing. You are a hero of faith because your suffering was able to produce so much. And by the way, it doesn't produce everything for now. Character and give you hope for now. There's a hope for the future for you as well. All right? There's a great hope that awaits you in the future. Enza, where's Enza? You've been, can I just say this, you've been outstanding in just how you've dealt with everything you've gone through. You could have been completely, you were buffeted, but you could have been taken out. But you've used this for the glory of Christ. Amen. And you've been absolutely amazing. And like Hebrews, it's about so a cloud of witnesses for you girls who are applauding you for what God is doing and has done for you. It's just amazing. And by the way, God is enough for you. Yes. And He will provide as He's always provided. Amen. And there are many here who are suffering. Some of you have spoken about it. Some may not have done. And let me just say this. Let it be like Paul for the glory of Christ. Amen. Amen. That Jesus is seen and beautiful in the midst of pain and suffering. Let me just talk very briefly about well, the future. I'll be about five minutes or so. Paul doesn't just talk about our suffering, but he also talks about the fact that in the future we're going to be heirs. It's not just about what we're going through now, but there's something glorious and something beautiful that God has in store for us and has prepared for us. What are we going to inherit as the people of God? The first one is we're going to inherit the nations. I really don't know what that looks like, but the Bible talks about it. So it says, it was by faith that Abraham and his descendants would in inherit the the world. What does that mean? Who are the inheritors of Abraham? By faith. It was not through the law, it was through faith that the inheritance of Abraham and Abraham would inherit, inherit the world. Which means we, by faith, are inheritors of Abraham. One day, we will inherit the world. I don't know what it looks like. In that messianic psalm, in Psalm 2, 8, God says to his son, Jesus Christ, he says, ask. And I'll give you the nations. So one of the things, brothers and sisters, that we will inherit is the nations. And I don't know how that's going to happen, but God knows how we're going to inherit the nations. Amen. The second thing that we will inherit is we will inherit God himself. Do you remember Numbers 10? But also it's repeated in Joshua 13, uh, 33, where Joshua is allotting the, uh, the land that you've just captured to the different tribes of Israel and then he says he says as you said in Numbers 10 he says as for you the Levites I'm not going to give you a piece of land because God himself is your inheritance Amen. let me just say this we are inheriting God what does that look like? The psalmist says in Psalm 16, he says, My inheritance and my portion is the Lord. We are not just inheriting the nations, we would inherit God. And let me just ask you one question. If you embraced Christianity and you ended up in glory in the future and you had everything that God has always promised you to have, but you didn't have God, would you be satisfied. Mm. 
If you went to the new heavens and the new earth, you got your, cr your crown of glory and you got everything that you've always asked for or been waiting for for a very long time and you found God wasn't there, the question is, would you be happy? God is enough for us. And when he says we inherit God, it means we have God with us every day, every night, eternally, forever, without any end. The last thing that we inherit, as the Bible says in Romans 8, is we inheriting our new bodies. The bodies that have been suffering all this time, one day God is going to give you a new body. A body that doesn't have any problems that you currently have. If you are limping, a body that doesn't have that. If you have a back problem, a body that doesn't have any back ache at all. If you have any situation, but a body that is free from cancer, a body that is free from disease and illness, but a body that will live eternally with God. That's why you inherit him. Let me just say this. There's just, there's just a few small things sometimes. I don't know, Joel spoke a while back when he was talking about the future and he talked about, he, he mentioned um, that um, during Christmas time, for Christmas, his, his uh, father and mother-in-law, they get him salt. Do you remember that? Some of you would remember. And let me just say this. One of the things I hope in the future we wouldn't have is salt. <laughs> The reason I'm saying that, you think is because there's certain, certain things that annoy you right now, unless you guys don't get annoyed, that annoy you right now, you're thinking, Lord, in the future, in the new body, when the crown is on me, may there be no socks. Let me tell you my story of socks. So Joe loves his socks. He's got some incredible pairs. It's like very, very colorful, like purple and yellow and stuff like that. I don't wear socks like that. But anyway, here's my problem with socks. I lose them all the time. <laughs> and I get sometimes, I could get... No, I'm wearing this. It's, it's a pair, by the way. Just <laughs> it. Don't ask me straight after this meeting what I'm wearing. <laughs> they fit. I don't want some of you to be going like this. But one of the things that is because I, I always arrange my... Even my washing, everything is always there. But always, I just... I do my washing and then I come and I fold my socks and there's always one sock missing. <laughs> Has that ever happened with you? Yeah. And it's so annoying, isn't it? Yeah. Come on, Christians! Yes. <laughs> and the other thing about socks is that when I put stuff in the washing, I make sure that nothing is left here. <laughs> and I put it, I switch the, the machine, it goes on. I turn around, there's one sock that's left in <laughs> If you haven't done that, you're probably in glory already. And I love that. But I have that problem. In the future, all these annoying things will no longer annoy you. Because you're going to be with Christ in the new heavens and new earth, as heirs of the promise, forever with Jesus Christ. That's what the future holds for you. Now, we seem to be going through some turbulence, suffering problems that are happening right now. Let's be real about them and let's seek God. But the future is more exciting, friends. It's super exciting. Let me finish with this now. Some of you have read The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis. Have you read it? Yeah. Or you, you might have watched Narnia. Yeah. Great. And it takes place in the, in, in the UK around 1939 when it was the Second World War. And during the Second World War, what was happening was, at that time, was they thought that London was going to be attacked and they took all the young kids away into the countryside and uh, these four kids, they're four, right? And they end up in this beautiful, beautiful country home and, and one of them, Lu Lucy, she goes through the wardrobe, right? And where does she end up? Narnia. And then she tells her, everyone else that, hey, there's a world that's so much amazing now there and they don't believe it. And they go through the wardrobe as well. This side, there's a wall. In Narnia, they receive crumbs. That's Lucy, you're gonna rule this place. 
a brother, you're going to rule this place. Let me just say this. You're not going through the wardrobe, but the future is more amazing than what we currently have. And we have our future with Christ Jesus simply because we are heirs and co-heirs with Christ Jesus by the grace of God. Let's all stand.